and welcome to Small Caps. I'm your host, Jess Holland. Today, we are speaking with Elevate Uranium. The ticket code is EL8. EL8 is an ASX-listed uranium stock with projects in Namibia. In the last couple of weeks, the stock has been flying up to 65%. Here to tell us more is the Managing Director and CEO, Mr. Murray Hill. Hi, Murray. It's lovely to see you. Hi, Jess. Uh, good to see you as well. Great. So, Murray, just to kick off, um, can you give our small caps audience just a brief overview of the company? As you said, we're an ASX-listed uranium exploration company. We are the only company on the ASX with uranium in our name. We're very proud of the fact that we're in the uh, in the uranium business uh, and we see the bright future it has. You mentioned that we're in Namibia. We're also in Australia. We're geographically diverse. We've got uh, assets in both com- uh, both countries and we're doing exploration in both. And what we've also got is the upgrade process. It's a process we developed in-house. It's a beneficiation process that um, reduces the amount of material to be leached uh, post-mining uh, and potential to reduce the um, the cost by 50% for capital and 50% for operating compared to conventional. And what better time to be in the uranium industry? Absolutely. Now, Murray, the company has been, you know, undertaking an extensive ongoing drilling program um, at the Copies Project in Namibia. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that drilling program and also, you know, what are the key goals or objectives that you're you're looking to achieve? So we started drilling copies um, shortly after we got it granted back in July of 2019. Uh, within the first three years of tenure, we put a resource of £20 million pound on it, unprecedented in the country. No one's ever done that in terms of resource within that first three-year tenure. We then realised that this was bigger than the £20 million. Pound. Uh, it's got a 20-kilometre strike length, uh, the full length of the tenement we hold, and we started to throw rigs back at it. So July last year, we've put another rig in, two rigs on it. And then May this year, we've gone to, we need to get another rig. So <clears throat> we've now got three rigs drilling at copies, all on expiration come sort of uh, definition come expiration, sort of three different phases. And what we're planning to do is we're planning to get a resource update out uh, next month if uh, if all works to plan, and then another one in Q1 next year. But the thing about copies is we'll be drilling, and by the way, behind me is copies. That is the copies project. Um, so a beautiful place to be in the desert in Namibia. Um, underneath there, right where I'm sitting, is um, is some uranium. And, um, you know, we're drilling five holes per day per rig. I don't think you'll interview many people are drilling five holes per day per rig. These holes are 25 metres deep. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. So we're drilling 15 holes per day. So the, the crew go out on a Monday morning, come back in the Swalcott Monitor on the Friday night, and they drill 75 holes per week. Mind you, we've still got in excess of 2,000 holes. As of July the 1st, we had 2,000 plus holes to drill here. And of course, every time you do some exploration, you're finding that, you know, there's a little bit more you've got to chase. So we know that 2,000 holes is going to grow, but uh, we're aiming um, we're aiming to complete the exploration in terms of the resource update uh, early next year, uh, but we'll probably continue drilling with one rig there uh, because we know the extensions will have to follow up. So it's quite an exciting project for us. Wow, Murray. Okay, so just to sort of summarise that I've got this clearly. So you've got three rigs on site, drilling five holes a day each, so 15 holes a day. On top of that, you've got your interim resource estimate for copies coming out next month, uh, aiming to get out next month, and then another update or an update in uh, first quarter next year. Yeah, yeah. And and the one thing, the one thing I didn't mention it's inexpensive. Each hole costs us thousand dollars. That's inexpensive drilling. Why so we're not wasting that? millions of dollars exploring. Sorry, why what? Yeah. So Murray, why is that? Why why yeah. is it so inexpensive? Well, as you can see, there's no clearing to do. Right. So that side of it's pretty easy. Um, so your grid lines are, are pretty easy to put in for your drilling. And um, we're drilling 25 minutes deep. I mean, all these resources are within 25 metres of the surface, most of them within a metre of the surface. Wow. So it's it's shallow. Uh, it's secondary to uranium. Uh, they're not deep holes. It's not difficult drilling. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's inexpensive. Wow. Okay, so relatively um, shallow <laughs> sand cover in the desert at Copies. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, fantastic. All right. So now, so what are your sort of future plans for further drilling at Copies 3 and Copies 4 then? So we'll we'll focus our efforts on Copies 3 um, and hopefully get the sort of tour state to resource next month. Um, then we'll move down to sort of Copies 2 South, Copies 4. And as I said before, we know that we're probably not going to finish the drilling. Uh, because you know we're now with we're defining where the resource goes and we're seeing that there's a breakout to the east and to the west and so we're gonna have to follow those up so but we also need to move on other exploration activities so come the christmas break we'll come back from that one rig will stay at copies uh tidying up around there another rig will go to uh up to the central orongo area and a third rig will come around the other projects in the Dharma area. Because we have, I'm not sure whether you know, we have the largest land package for nuclear fuels in the country. Wow. Uh, we've got 10, 10 tenements we're um, we're exploring on. We've got four discoveries in the last four years, so we want to follow those up. So, you know, there's a lot of work for us to do. Um, and if the uranium market keeps heating up, maybe those three rigs need to turn into more. So it's an exciting time to be in the uranium and exciting time for us with such a land package and with such exploration success, inexpensive drilling. Wow. Okay. That's amazing, Murray. So now just let's honing in on that. What are your thoughts on sort of the long-term potential of the Copies project and, and Elevate Uranium's, you know, other Namibian tenements more generally? Look, Copies is, uh, is certainly looking to be our favourite at the moment, but, um, you know, we'll, when the uranium price starts to move strongly, I mean, it is over 60 bucks a pound now, which is a fantastic little move. But, um, you know, it probably needs to be in excess of 75 to really get um, people excited about uh, developing projects. But what we want to do is we want to keep exploring and work out whether copies is our favourite or we have another favourite out there. Um, so we just want to, we want to find more pounds uh, across our Namibian tenements in particular, and then we'll work out where which project is going to go first. But... Copies, if copies goes first, I mean, it's shallow. The mining is going to be relatively simple, low strip ratios, something like a surface miner that cuts at about half a metre. Sort of a machine that you see digging up, you know, tar or where you come from in South Africa or bitumen, uh, as we call it here, um, digging up those roads, that's sort of a, a, what we would mine with. And then we'd take it through our upgrade process. Reduce the mass prior to leaching to less than 5%. And then we have optionality. Do we develop, uh, put a leach uh, refinery on site, produce yellow cake ourselves, or do we take it to somewhere like, say, for instance, Rossing in Namibia, have been there since 1976, continuously operating, longest running uranium mine in the world. So there's two generations of culture in Namibia that, that understand uranium. So that could be an option for us, take concentrate there. So the beauty of having this upgrade process in Namibia is that we've got optionality as to what we do with our concentrate. So you know, we've got, we don't want to sort of make a decision on exactly what we think the project looks like now. Let's find out how many pounds we've got. Let's find out, you know, when the running price starts to go, what we're going to do. So if you, if you tend to sort of conclude which path you're going to take before you get there, you don't often see the wood from trees. So when we developed Upgrade, we had our eyes wide open uh, and we looked at everything. So we want to do the same when we develop these projects, keep our eyes wide open, don't get tunnel vision. Uh, and, and uh, you know, who knows where the copies will end up, but certainly I think it will be developed um, sooner than later. Yeah, fantastic. So when the when the resource comes out um, in the next month mm -hmm. or so, will this be when you start to sort of look at the test work for leaching processes or when does that sort of start? Uh, look, we'll, once we initiate um, indicated drilling, you know, to get the resource into indicated status, because the thing about inferred status, you can't announce financial metrics, uh, as most people would know. So we'll kick off so an indicated drilling program and we'll kick off the metallurgical test work on the beneficiation process uh, to make sure we understand it and take it through to a pilot stage and, and you know, beyond into, into development. So, yeah, we'll, we'll run those parallel, the metallurgical test work program and the indicated drilling program. Yeah, fantastic, Murray. Now, you mentioned that the U uranium price was sitting at around 60. Now, so from a macro perspective, you know, the uranium price, spot price, uh, market price has been, you know, rising um, higher at the moment. What do you think is driving that surge in the uranium price? A couple of things is one is the supply demand. We um, haven't got enough supply of uranium to meet the current nuclear fleet demand. Um, and that's been just getting worse and worse over the last five years in particular. 
and headed to the point where, you know, the utility is going to have to do something, nuclear utilities. They're going to have to buy uranium. Otherwise, they're going to be caught short. And the worst thing you can do as a nuclear utility is run out of uranium, run out of your feedstock. So that's that's happening. But also the world is going down this decarbonisation electrification path. And it's also pushing renewables. Now, without criticising renewables too much, but the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day, so you need a backup power source. And the wind doesn't blow, right? Except in some places people think it blows more often than not. But, of course, there are dull periods where the wind doesn't blow. So where are you going to get your energy from? You want a reliable, low-cost baseload energy that's there all the time. And that's what nuclear is. So we need nuclear, and people are realising that. They're realising that renewables really aren't, you know, if we're going to have a backup system, do we want gas? Do we want coal? Well, no, we probably want nuclear. And why have a backup system? Just put nuclear in. You don't need to put two systems in. So I think for uh, us in Australia, the the small modular reactors are going to be the thing of the future. Uh, It's somewhere you can just replace a coal-fired power station with. All right, so you're saying grid. If you're going to put renewables in, not only are they, are they consuming a large area of land, right, uh, which is creating problems, but they also have to put new grids in. So it, it's a huge amount of um, infrastructure to go in to put it in. And I suppose without the government funding, they probably wouldn't have that great an industry. So there is the realisation that, that renewables aren't the best thing for us, even though we've been pushed down that path. And funnily enough, electric cars, they have batteries in them. Batteries store energy, batteries discharge energy. Where do batteries get their energy from? They get it from the grid at the moment. So, you know, if we go down this electrification path, there's a huge amount of energy required that's got to be pulled from the grid. Well, where's it? When we're shutting coal-fired power stations down in Australia, where's, where are we going to get it from? So we have to do something a little bit smarter than what we're currently doing. And I think most of the world's starting to realise that that's the case and nuclear is not the answer but it's part of the part of the energy mix going forward. So, uh, and has been for a long time. Um, so, yeah, I think there's two things. One is the supply demand and also the demand and, and the sentiment around it. And you can see, as you, you pointed out, our share price has gone up, in, you know, from 29 cents to to 50 odd. Uh, so, you know, over the last couple of weeks. So, and most of us have gone up. So, yeah, look, we're, and we're leveraged to that sentiment. We're leveraged to uranium. And we and we leverage our exploration activities, so we're um, we're in a great position. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Where you say, you know, uranium may not be the sole answer, but it's definitely, you know, a component towards the solution. So a puzzle piece yeah. towards the solution. And I think, you know, I think all of this 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 race to net zero in 2035, it's going to take a lot. Um, so, you know, we've got to have your sort of renewable energy coming in, but, you know, potentially uranium, more uranium plants coming, um, you know, into production. And, yeah, it's, it's going to be really, really interesting to see how, you know, globally political, um, you know, governments manage this process and this transition in a sustainable way um, that won't, you know, hugely uh, or detrimentally affect consumers um, and energy prices. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, imagine if you come home at night and you're told you can't charge your electric vehicle and your lights don't work. Disaster if you can't, the lights don't work, you can't watch telly. What would people do? I mean, we just expect that we walk home, we turn the light switch on. Uh, well, your your country of origin, we have blackouts regularly. Um California have been told a number of times they can't charge their vehicles at, uh, in the evening because they don't have enough electricity on the grid. You know, I've heard recently a country that's got 50 million vehicles, if 2% of those, right, 1 million vehicles was to go electric and charge on the grid, it would double the demand on the grid. Where's that energy going? And that's 2%. Imagine if we're at 50, well, they want to go to 100, 3, oh, it's not going to happen, but you know, you just don't have the energy. So, you know, we need more energy, a hell of a lot more of it, and we need reliable baseline energy because you want your lights to work at night. You don't want to come home and go, Oh, it's my turn to lose power. Well, how about the food in my freezer? So, yeah, it is. I'm starting to waffle, but at the end of the day, I think you get the message we do need uh, reliable baseline energy. Absolutely. I mean, Murray, you, you pointed out earlier that I am South African and. 
if any of our listeners, small caps uh, audience are listening um, who are South African, they really understand, uh, you know, the, the energy crisis that's happening in South Africa with ESCOM. You know, they have load shedding, stage three, four load shedding where they, they don't have electricity. Uh, you know, the, the, the government um, hasn't maintained infrastructure um, as well. And yeah, they're going to certainly be looking at uh, various options to bring energy back into the grid. So perhaps yeah. even late in Namibia, yeah. South Africa, who knows? Well, they do have a nuclear reactor in Cape Town, so maybe oh. they'll expand their, their nuclear capacity. I think they're talking about expanding their nuclear capacity, which is good news. And I have to, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Murray, um, just one last question for you, which is, you know, can you give our audience just two or three key takeaways as to, you know, why EL8 is a potentially good investment for them? Yeah, well, obviously, as I said before, we're exposed to the, what we just talked about, things that we can't control the demand for energy, the, the supply demand or issue around around uranium. So we're exposed to that. But what we're also exposed to and leveraged to is what we do as a company. What we're doing as a company is uranium focused. We are drilling in Namibia with great success. We're expecting updates on the resource of copies over the next, you know, six, five, six months. Um, and they're moving around Namibia on expiration. We haven't even mentioned Australia. There's so many things to talk about in Namibia. We've got a lot of things happening there as well. So we're, we're geographically diverse. We've got success in exploration point of view, uh, and we're in the right commodity at the right time. What better time to be in uranium now? It's a fantastic time to be in it. So it's quite exciting for us, quite exciting for shareholders. I mean, shareholders are bought in two weeks ago. and will be over the moon right now. Probably some of them are selling today uh, because they're up so far. Uh, but if I was them, I'd be holding. Uh, you know, we're we're headed on a very, very good ride uh, on in this uh, uranium industry. So, yeah, very exciting. No, fantastic, Murray. And I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head, you know, even if shareholders are selling today, the whole point of being in business is to create shareholder value and you have done that um, for your shareholders. So that is, you know, that's it's huge testament to you and your team um, and being in the right place at the right time and in the right commodity. So congratulations. Um, Andrew, thank you for all of your insights. It's always great to chat to you. And I hope we get you back online soon to chat about the resource um, that's coming out next month. And yeah, all the best with that. Thanks, Jess. And thanks for listening, people.